सो मद्गम तमसो मोतिर्गम मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शातिशाशाति ओम लीड अस फ्रॉम दि अनरियल टू द रियल लीड अस फ्रॉम डार्कनेस अन टू लाइट लीड अस फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोटैलिटी ओम पीस 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 the subject this morning all of it or none of it hmm. is actually a quote from swami virajananda ji swami t's guru swami tathagatan ji's guru uh, swami virajananda ji was the president of our order many many uh, years decades ago so among his sayings i found this this whole world is presented to me along with the body so either i am all of it or none of it hmm. See, it's a simple thing that we don't notice. We are aware. What are we aware of? Everything, the world, this body, our thoughts, and the external world, which is revealed to us, people, all of it together. What we normally do is, we say, "I am this," and the rest is not me. This, other, subject, object. but that doesn't st- uh, stand to reason once you consider it in this way that the whole thing is presented to me the awareness i'm aware of what i'm aware of the world i'm aware of the body also so why do i say this is me and that's not me this is i and that's not i either i am all of it body and the universe or none of it this is what uh, swami virajananda ji meant and while reading the ashtavakra gita I came across this very verse. So Swami Virajan Ji was quoting from the Ashtavakra Gita in the second chapter of the Ashtavakra Gita, in the second verse of the second chapter. The verse goes: Yatha prakashayam yeko deham me nam tatha jagat ata mama jagat sarvam. अथवा न च किंचन एज आई बाय माय सेल्फ रिवील दिस बॉडी एंड दिस एंटायर यूनिवर्स देर फोर देर फोर इधर ऑल ऑफ दिस यूनिवर्स इज माइन और नन ऑफ इट इज वट अ ब्यूटिफुल वर्स वट अ रेडियंट वर्स आई एम स्ट्रक विथ वंडर यू नो Byram says that uh, Ashtavakra, when uh, all the religious teachers and philosophers and poets have said what they wanted to say and fallen silent, Ashtavakra begins to speak. And what he says is, words seem to come out of luminosity. They appear on the paper in paper and ink. They come out of a radiance and. the moment they touch the paper and you know, ink and paper and then the next moment they disappear back into that radiance they're so luminous and this verse is like that i was so wonderstruck at this wonderful verse that uh, i thought i want to share my wonder with you today um ashtavakra says that just as i uh, di- you know illum- illumine this body so do i illumine this entire world and uh, therefore uh, i identify myself with only this body this is my body uh, but then i should also say that the whole world is mine on that principle or none of it is so we will go into this today in some detail it may seem like abstract and heavy philosophy but um, uh, it's about you it's about us so it's the most exciting subject that is and the most subject dearest to our heart i me myself <laughs> that's why advaita vedanta is very interesting because you should take it as your story first of all this we must start with the consideration of this body mind ourselves what we think of ourselves vedanta always starts with ourself and here ashtavakra gives us a clue yatha prakash prakashayami eka deham enam as i um, reveal as i um, illumine uh, this body now by this this statement he gives us a clue 
where we begin our our investigation if i am illumining something then that thing is not me if i am revealing something then that thing is not me if i am aware of something then that thing is not me it's not i just like um the light is there and that light falls on this table and the clock and the microphone and it reveals these things but the light is not what it illumines it is something it's the same light which reveals not only the table the, the lectern but the clock and the microphone and yet is distinct from the table and the clock and the microphone the table and the clock and the microphone are not luminous they don't reveal themselves they don't reveal themselves they don't reveal each other but the light reveals all of this and reveals itself it does not require one more light to reveal it similarly consciousness you know upanishads call consciousness the light of lights why because though this light reveals everything without your eyes none of it will be revealed to you so the eyes reveal the light itself but without the mind the, even if the eyes are working if your mind is asleep or not attentive you will not experience anything and the mind itself without consciousness whatever is presented in the mind will not be experienced so consciousness is the light of the lights the light of this light is your eyes the light of your eyes is the mind the light of your mind is consciousness the light of consciousness no it is it is the light of lights it is the only one which is self luminous shines forth and reveals everything to you to me to us the knowing subject that which is light that which is awareness must be distinct from its objects the luminous and the non luminous the aware and the not aware in sanskrit chit jada they cannot be the same thing another way of understanding this is that that which is the knower and that which is known uh, that which is the seer and that which is the seen they cannot be the same thing drashta and drishya we are famous we are uh, uh, familiar with this uh, argument consider the eyes themselves the eyes are the uh, seer and this material world is the seen now clearly the eyes can see only things which are at a distance from themselves mm-hmm. um, one thing that the eyes cannot see are the eyes themselves sometimes we we don't even see our own glasses because uh, they are very close to our eyes and they are they are transparent so we see through them so and even closer than the glasses are the eyes themselves the eyes cannot make themselves an object i mean you can see a reflection in a mirror you can see a selfie taken on a camera but the eyes cannot directly see themselves the way they see other things the seer and the seen they must be different um if you apply this to the body why to the body the world ashtavakra knows and we all know we don't consider ourselves to be the world that's that's the whole problem you know we don't say that i am the everything i am just this much now ashtavakra says start your journey there you just take look at what you think you are i am this body now this body is it an object of awareness yes i am aware of it in that case you are the light and this is the object and the light and the object are not the same thing that light and this object are not the same thing and though the light reveals the object but it's not the same thing consciousness and its object are not the same thing consciousness and the body are not the same thing i am aware of it i am conscious the body is something that i'm aware of it's not conscious um exactly the same argument will uh, apply like, like a little variation drashta and drishya do you see it yes i can objectify the body with my senses i can see it i can touch it i can smell it i can taste it i can even hear it in you know, the rumblings in my tummy all of these all the five senses can objectify the body i am the seer hearer smeller whatever it is of the body and the body is that which is heard seen touched smelt it's an object it is drishyam i am drashta i am the seer it is the seen seer and seen cannot be the same thing they're different therefore i the seer of the body am not the body notice that subtle difference in the two arguments one is i am conscious and the body is an object not conscious the conscious and the non conscious cannot be the same thing therefore i'm not the body the second argument is i am the seer the knower 
And the body is the seen, the known, knower and known, seer and seen. They cannot be the same thing. It's a variation on the first uh, argument. Another argument you can take, even simpler. The body is a continuous series of changes. And I experience each of them. Uh, babyhood and uh, childhood and youth and middle age and old age. All of these tremendous changes going on in the body. A and I experience all of them. I have an intuitive sense of a continuity of this. I, I am the knower of myself in this body, in childhood, in babyhood, in youth. And the body is a series of changes. I, the unchanging subject, and the body, the changing object. Changing and unchanging. In Sanskrit, savikara, nirvikara. Nirvikara, unchanging. Savikara, with change, with modification. How can the same thing be changing and unchanging? It's like, as simple as, something is moving. Now, if you attach yourself to that moving thing, either the moving thing will stop or you will be dragged along with it. You cannot have both together. The moving thing will uh, keep on moving and yet you don't move. And yet you are attached to it. The two cannot go together. You cannot have any relationship with the, with the changing. One sadhu in Uttarakhand used to say, that which is eternal and that which is non-eternal, they have no relationship. And yet they seem to have a relationship. And that's the thing. Now, savikara nirvikara, changing and unchanging, with modification, without modification, and they cannot be the same thing. Therefore, for these reasons, what are these reasons? Three reasons I've given you. And I can supply at least four or five more good reasons. These reasons, conscious, not conscious. I, the conscious, and the body, not conscious. I cannot be the body. Uh, I, the uh, knower, the seer, and the body is the seen. Not just physically the seen with the eyes, but five senses. And the body is the object of all the senses. It is the uh, known. Knower and known. Seer and seen. Drashta drishya. Therefore, I cannot be the body. And third, uh, the more simply, the more intuitive kind of argument. I am the unchanging, and the body is, the cha is changing. And therefore, the unchanging and changing cannot be the same thing. Therefore, I am not the body. These arguments are more like, you know, like an arguments lawyers make in the court to convince the jury. Uh, they are not mathematical demonstrations. They are like persuasive. First, they persuade our reason. And then, don't abandon them there. That, okay, I get it. I see what you're trying to say. Not just trying to say. Now, having been convinced, use them as pointers to change the way you look at the body. Instead of saying, I, and you say, this. This body. So, you, it, the arguments will change our paradigm. Entire way of looking at myself and the body. Ashtavakra just says, Yatha prakashaya, prakashayami eko dehamenam. This body as I reveal, illumine this body. Therefore, we com complete it. I, I cannot be the body. Even more so, when you look inwards, what we more closely identify ourselves with, this mind, its thoughts, feelings, memories, experiences, our personal story, this person, which is basically a mental being, constituted of likes and dislikes, memories, our own story. Am I this person? Same example, same arguments apply. Apply it here. Am I revealing the mind? Am I illumining the mind? Yes, the mind is revealed. My thoughts are revealed to me. They may not be revealed to anybody else unless you are a telepath. But I directly have this perception. It's Technically, it's called apperception. I directly experience my own thoughts. When uh, uh, there is pain... Who experiences the pain but me? I experience the pain. Therefore, I reveal the mind. I reveal this, the, the co contents of the mind. I reveal this person I thought I was. But if I reveal it, then I am the illuminer. I am the consciousness which reveals the mind which is an object, the illumined. Same argument holds. Chit jada. Therefore, I cannot be the mind. And this is such a stunning, a, a stunner really. Uh, that uh, we, The closest thing that we have, the one which we automatically, naturally identify ourselves with, are the contents of our minds. That's who I am. Anger. I am angry. I am anger. 
<laughs> I say, I am angry, but I become one with that. But it's a content in the mind. And the interesting thing is, if you think in that way, if you just bring this thought, this understanding to your mind, if there is anger, anger will be pacified. It cools down. Somehow it's our identification with the mind which strengthens it, whatever the contents are. The other, the second argument, drashta drishya, the same thing holds. Am I not aware of the contents of my mind? If I illumine the contents of the mind, then I am the knower, I am the seer of the mind. And the seer and the seen are different, and therefore I cannot be the mind. Seer, of course, within quotes. And then changing and unchanging. That's a direct uh, thing, you know, like the mind is changing so much. So many thoughts, feelings, emotions. Somebody said, um, in an average waking day, we have 16,000 discrete uh, you know, uh, thoughts, feelings, emotions, uh, all sorts of things. That is one deep interpretation of Krishna and the gopis. Gopis are supposed to be 16,000 and Krishna is one. Krishna is consciousness and the gopis are various vrittis, modifications of the mind. So they are all dancing around Krishna. Krishna is illumining all of them. So in that sense. Anyway, changing and unchanging. The same arguments. Chit jada, consciousness, not consciousness. And then drashta drishya, seer and seen. And changing and unchanging. Savikara, nirvikara. Therefore, I am not the mind. I am not the body. I am not the mind. Because I illumine the body and the mind. I am the knower of the body and the mind. I am the, I am the unchanging. And the body and mind are continuously changing. Therefore, I am not this. All of Advaita begins here. This is not Advaita, by the way. One Uttarakhand Sadhu put it nicely. Jo karte rehte hai na, ye kacche vedanti hai. Those who keep on doing this, I am not the body, not the mind, they are unripe Vedantins. <laughs> they are beginners. <laughs> so the, yes, this is the beginning. This is the very end of the process called Sankhya. This is what Sankhya is driving at. But uh, Advaita begins here, it starts. This is the ABCD of Advaita. At this point, um, we will say, no, 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 I never said I am flesh and bone. But what I mean is I am, this is my body. Yes, I would, I'm willing to go so far as to admit I am not the mind, I am not my thoughts. It's my thoughts. Don't you hear what I'm saying? It's my thoughts. It's my body. And Ashtavakra is ahead of us there. He says it's not even mine. The body is not mine, the... Uh, it's, it's none of it is mine. The body is not mine, even the thoughts, the mind is also not mine. How so? I do feel it's mine. Why do you think the body is yours? Did you make it? No, I didn't make it. Uh, but, oh, all right, somebody gave it to you as a gift. Do you have the papers for it? <laughs> the insurance and the, you know, the, the documents of transfer and document of purchase? No. Do you own the materials out of which the body was built? Uh, the various, you know, the earth and fire and water and air, or the various elements of the periodic table out of which the body is made. Do you own it? Was it? <laughs> no, none of it. We say, look, look, it's, it's not that. What I mean is, I experience the body from within, and it, I can control it. Mm. I, I, I'm in charge of it. Really? Are we really in charge of it? How much of it are we in charge of? The vast majority of the biochemical processes going on which keep this body alive and functioning, we have no idea. It's just modern science is beginning to discover some of it. It's vast and complicated and very sophisticated. We would have no idea of what to do if we were, you know, suddenly the body says, okay, nature says, all right, you think you are in charge. Here, take the wheel. Drive this body around, take it for a spin. We'd collapse, you know, Mount Sinai, <laughs> emergency room within <laughs> minutes. You'd have to call 911. What happened? He took charge of his body. <laughs> He's having a seizure. <laughs> That's what would happen to us. We have no idea uh, how, how to run even a tiniest fraction of the processes going on in this body. Gita, Krishna says to Arjuna, Prakriti eva karmani kriyamanani sarvasha. That all the processes which are going on in this entire universe and this body, the body is part of the universe, 
everything is being done by nature. He doesn't even say God is doing it or I am Krishna doing it. This is just nature does it. Ahankara vimuratma kartahim iti manyate. Deluded by the functioning of the ego, the sentient being thinks, I am the doer, I am the controller. You are not. It is not your body. It's nature's body, God's body, whoever. But it's not ours. In no, no way it is ours. It's continuously changing. The changes will not stop for us. Mm. I like this being young. Let's stop here. No. <laughs> it won't. So it doesn't obey us. We are not in charge of it. It's not mine. No more so is the mind yours. Neither the body nor the mind are mine. I am not the body. The body is not mine. I am not the mind. The mind is not mine. This is the fundamental insight which is given to us in Advaita Vedanta. This, this clear separation between consciousness and everything else. As Ashtavakra says, everything is revealed to me by consciousness. And that which is revealed to me by consciousness, or I the consciousness, I am become aware of it, that must be different from me. I am not it, it's an object. So is this body, which I am so, I hold on to it so tightly, it's not me. And the mind is also not me. And the senses and the perceptions which I get, pleasure, pain, they are also not me, nor mine. They are no more yours than the movie which you are watching on a screen is yours. When you watch a movie on a screen, are you the movie? No. Is the movie yours in some sense? No. It's not me, it's not mine. Now, if you stop here, this is called Sankhya. But this is not Advaita Vedanta. We have made a clear distinction between two things, consciousness and everything else. Awareness and everything else. Now the great question arises, what is the relationship between you, the awareness, and everything else, including this body? So it's not you. Is it something separate, independent? That's what I, are, are we trying to say that? Or what is the relationship of the object to consciousness? What is the relationship of the many to the one? Yeah. What is the relationship of the other to you? What is the relationship of the object to the subject? All of these are the same question. If you say, so now we'll see what are the answers. Um, we will go through a four-step process and then the fourth step will be broken into seven steps and the seventh step will again be broken into five more steps and so on. So there's, don't worry. It's, an, uh, it's a thrilling journey. Let's dive right into it. In the Aparokshanubhuti, if you remember Shankaracharya, in the middle of the text, after showing that you are not the body and you are not the mind, and then he says, I was pulling a fast one on you. <laughs> it's not that body, mind, you know, the material universe are different from you, the awareness. Uh, Swami Brahmananda says, show me the line of demarcation between matter and spirit. Show me the line of demarcation between matter and spirit. Then why did you separate? Why did you go through all this trouble? Half the lecture is over and you did, I'm not the body, not the mind, not this, not that. Why did you do that? In order to see that I am awareness, in order to see that I am consciousness, I must first come to see that I am not this little slice of the universe called body-mind. See, what, what do we normally do? Instinctively. Here is this universe. Like Swami Virajanandaji, we don't say that I am all of it um, or none of it. We say I am this much and not that much. And then samsara starts. I and the other, subject and object, come into play. In order to short-circuit that process, we must first see <coughs> this body-mind which I identified myself with. I am not this also. I am the witness of this. I am the consciousness aware of this body and mind. <coughs> so, um, now the question arises, I am awareness. And everything in this universe, world and this body and mind, everything is presented to me. I experience it in awareness, presented to me, in me. Now what is the connection between awareness? I'm using the words awareness, consciousness interchangeably. None of them quite fit in the concept which you find in Vedanta or in the different Indian philosophies. The precise um, uh, words used in Indian philosophy, there are a number of words, but there's no uh, analogous word, no equivalent word in English. The words in Sanskrit are chit, 
चैतन्य चिति संवित बोध मल्टीपल वर्ड्स आर देर एंड दे ऑल मीन द सेम थिंग अवेयरनेस इट सेल्फ बट दैट कॉन्सेप्ट इज नॉट देर इन वेस्टर्न थॉट इन इवन द फिलोसफी ऑफ माइंड इट्स इट्स डिफिकल्ट टू ट्रांसलेट बट सो आई एम यूजिंग कॉन्शियसनेस एंड अवेयरनेस ना द क्वेश्चन अराइज इज वॉट इज द रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन कॉन्शियसनेस एंड मैटर instead of saying consciousness and object i'm saying consciousness and matter by matter you mean whatever is experienced in consciousness whatever is experienced by consciousness the material universe but remember in this i'm including the mind also because mind the contents of the mind thoughts feelings emotions and they are all memories they are all experienced if it's experienced then it's an object and that object i'm calling matter just for the sake of simplicity so what is the um, question deepest question of philosophy that what is the relationship between consciousness and matter between consciousness and the object between the one and the many four broad approaches are there the first approach is consciousness emerges out of matter who says this it is the materialist who says this and this is the what we have studied in science our modern mainstream science says this matter and energy time and space are fundamental and maybe they started with the big bang who knows but right now we see that this vast material universe in one corner of that you have the earth and some amount of matter some organic matter has somehow evolved into life and living bodies have evolved further over millions and millions of years evolving sophisticated nervous systems and brains in that nervous system and brain in a living body there's a byproduct an epiphenomenon called consciousness so matter has become living matter living matter has evolved into conscious living matter aware of itself and everything else that's the story that's the state of uh, understanding in modern mainstream science that's what we are taught in biology in you know school so matter produces consciousness it's a vast unconscious material universe and consciousness is just like a flickering flame at the in the corner of a dark mostly dark room the other uh, theory is opposite um, consciousness produces matter consciousness produces matter is aha advaita no not advaita vedanta <laughs> this is uh, that uh, the theory that that is propounded by the theistic religions of the world the dualistic three the- theistic religions of the world all the religions all the theologies which believe in the existence of god they say that there is this omnipresent omniscient omnipotent deity and one characteristic of god in all the theistic religions is the god is the creator of the universe in all the hindu systems of thought the deist uh, the theistic systems of thought god is the creator preserver and destroyer of the universe that from which the universe emerges in which it is sustained into which it it, it disappears and that's basically the idea in all the major theistic traditions of the world now the question is this god is it a conscious god or an unconscious god everybody will say god is conscious of course is is a conscious deity and in fact must be always conscious doesn't even sleep probably though in hinduism god does sleep uh, that is the destruction of the universe uh, when god takes a nap <laughs> so god is a conscious being after all when you say uh, omniscient all knowing that sort of implies there is consciousness there so from consciousness a material universe is emerges it is created that's the second approach first approach um, matter creates consciousness second approach consciousness god creates a material universe third approach neither create the other both exist eternally and they interact with each other consciousness and matter this should remind you of the sankhyan prakriti purusha dualism sankhya philosophy of kapila or patanjali's yoga philosophy um prakriti purusha dualism prakriti is all of nature all of this whatever you see all matter energy time space it's prakriti nature prakriti literally means nature and there is consciousness not a product of prakriti not being produced in brains it exists fundamentally and interacts with prakriti 
pretty close to what panpsychist theories are now being propounded by David Chalmers and some others. Either David Chalmers' panpsychism or Tononi's this um, fundamental consciousness. Consciousness is all pervasive and ubiquitous in nature. Uh, these ideas now, amazingly, at this time, in the early 21st century, are being propounded by a few. Hoffman, uh, Bernardo Castro, uh, David Chalmers, uh, Tononi. Uh, they, are, they are all saying different versions of the same thing. Their consciousness is fundamental, not reducible to um, matter. I remember seeing a huge collection of scientific papers called The Irreducible Mind. See, they are not making a distinction between mind and consciousness, but at least they are seeing that mind cannot be reduced directly to, the, to brain processes. So the irreducible mind and full of different papers. I remember one paper there which talked about pure consciousness. I was uh, very interested. I saw the paper, uh, an academic paper. But the title itself gave the whole game away. Pure consciousness events. The moment you say events, it, it's a red light for an Advaitin. Event is something that begins and ends. Event is something that's limited. It's here and not there. It starts now and ends then. Each event is different from the other event. So pure consciousness is not something that begins and uh, ends. Pure consciousness is not something that is experienced now and not experienced then. Pure consciousness is not something that's here and not there. Not that it's different here and different there. So, anyway. Irreducible mind. We are saying irreducible consciousness. That is the third theory. To give you context, what are we talking about here? It's easy to forget what's going on here. We are talking about what is the relationship. I am awareness and I am aware of this universe and body. So what is the relationship between me, the awareness and this entire universe and body? What is the relationship between consciousness and matter? And we have gone through first theory, second theory and our third theory. Consciousness and matter are parallel. They interact with each other. Consciousness was not born out of matter, nor was matter born out of consciousness. Then the fourth, there are other theories also, but the fourth one is uh, what we are interested in, is the Advaita idea. The Advaita idea is not that um, matter created consciousness, not that consciousness created matter, not even that the two realities which are interacting, like in Sankhya or Panpsychism. But that matter is an appearance in consciousness. Matter is an appearance in consciousness. Nivedita once said to Swami Vivekananda, Can I conceive of um, Kali as the dream of Shiva? And then Vivekananda thought for a moment and then he laughed and said, Well, well, so you can understand it in your own way. <laughs> so, Matter is like the dream of consciousness. Matter is an appearance in consciousness. And it's not something very, you know, radical or difficult to grasp. That's how we live life, basically. Isn't it? If you think of yourself as awareness, then everything else is appearing in you. Everything else. What you see is appearing in you. What you hear is appearing in you. What you smell, taste, touch is appearing in you. Your thoughts, ideas are appearing in you. And if you think that, no, no, they are not appearances, they are all out there. That's also a thought appearing in you. In you, the awareness. So whatever we experience, even the doubts about this theory, that's also an appearance in awareness. Um, Shankaracharya says, Yaeva tasya nirakatta tasyaiva atmasa. Whoever denies this theory, that is the very consciousness of that person in, in which you are denying this, <laughs> this understanding. Without this, neither affirmation nor denial is possible. So, the entirety of this universe is an appearance in consciousness. How do we understand this even further? Let me go through the seven-step reduction. It's something just I heard from the present Shankaracharya of Puri, uh, Nishchalaranda Saraswati Ji. He just threw it out in a couple of sentences. I will take a few more sentences than two. <laughs> seven steps. Seven steps to do what? To take matter. To take this universe and reduce it to an appearance in consci consciousness and further. Yeah. And all of this is to explain uh, Ashtavakras. Either all of it is uh, mine or none of it is. In order to explain that. Seven steps. Going from where? A solid real world out there. To consciousness only. 
So first, you start with the word as we understand it in common sense and let's say in at least not advanced quantum mechanics but school level science. A world out there independent of the subject, an objective world. The truth that there is an, there's an objective truth out there apart from the knowing subject. The very basis of science. Let's start with that. In Sanskrit, all of this, what I just said is called Jagat, world, Jagat. Then the next step, second step, remember seven steps. Second step is to reduce this world into matter, energy, time, space. Or in the old cosmology, the five elements, space and um, air and f fire and water and earth. Basically material constituents. All of this universe is constituted of fundamental matter and energy. And science has gone very far, very deep into it indeed, down to the quantum level, trying to understand what is this matter-energy continuum. Um, and we are beginning to see that time, space, matter, and energy are all tied up. They're part of one. Um, it's not that time and space are like a fixed stage on which matter and energy are the characters and playing out a, a drama. No, it's one continuous thing. The stage and the actors are all part of the same thing. So that is the second step. In Sanskrit, Panchabhuta Vilasa, very poetic, the play of five elements. In Indian languages like Bengali or other Hindi, it sounds like the play of five ghosts. This basically, which is true, <laughs> the five elements, the play of five elements. You go further, third step. What are these five elements? What is matter? Old joke, never mind. <laughs> and what is mind? No matter. <laughs> anyway, silly. Um, it is paradox. There's a name the ancients had for it, Maya. I'm reminded of Schopenhauer. His uh, masterpiece, the world is will and idea. Schopenhauer, Arthur Schopenhauer. In the first chapter, he says that four volumes, um, says what I'm going to write in these pages was best known to the ancient Hindus and they called it Maya. The nature of whatever we experience, this, this world. Paradox. Maya appears as the five elements. Taittiriya Upanishad says, Tasmat vai tasmat atmana akasha sambhuta akashad vayu vayo ragni agne rapa adbhya prithvi. From that one consciousness, within brackets, through Maya, appears space and air and fire and water and earth. Now one might say this is mystification. So far matter and energy we understand. Now, now you are reducing it all to something, Maya, paradox, what is this? This is mystification. You are quoting Upanishads, but quoting Upanishads is not going to convince us. We are modern people, 21st century. Well, let me give you 21st century quotes. <laughs> this is from Rebecca Goldstein in her uh, uh, biography of Godel. It's called Incompleteness. So there she says, Godel's incompleteness, Einstein's relativity, and Heisenberg's uncertainty. These are the greatest discoveries of science, the most fundamental discoveries of science in the 20th century. And to understand how radical these discoveries are, you have to see the mentality of scientists in the 19th century. If you had asked scientists in the 19th century, what do you see science as in the 20th century? They would not have said relativity. They would have said, you know, they would have said absoluteness. We'll get an absolute theory. What do you see mathematics as? And actually there was a mathematician, I think Hil uh, Hilbert probably, who set out the program for completing mathematics. He would have definitely not said incompleteness. He would have said mathematics will be completed. And that's what Godel smashed with his incompleteness theorem. Yeah. A scientist would have said we were aiming for certainty, not uncertainty. And what did we actually discover in the 20th century? Relativity, incompleteness, uncertainty. These are the terms which are used to describe Maya. Relativity, incompleteness, uncertainty. And then Rebecca Goldstein goes on to uh, write that this forever erased the myth of objectivity. This is not what we, in the deepest sense of science, at the practical school level, fine, objective, you have to be. But at the deepest level of our understanding of science right now, it's not that there is an objective truth out there apart from us, the observer. All right. So anyway, Maya, go deeper. And this is the 
uh, what was it? The third step, Maya Vilasa, the play of Maya. But Maya is nothing other than the power of uh, of Brahman, of of consciousness. So again, you are using mystic language, but no. Just look at it yourself. How do you, the awareness, how do you experience everything in your dreams, for example? There's a mysterious power to your mind which can now appear as a manifold dream universe. That mysterious power is the maya of your individual mind. The maya of consciousness is that, that paradoxical power which makes consciousness appear as this manifold universe to itself. Consciousness appears to itself through maya as this universe. So the fourth step is called Chid Vilasa, the play of consciousness. Whatever Maya is doing, it's the power of consciousness which shows itself as this universe. Or as Nivedita said, Kali is the dream of Shiva. Chid Vilasa, the play of consciousness. This is the whole, the profound, sophisticated, uh, a very complex philosophy of Kashmiri Shaivism. The entire universe is the play of Shiva. They, they have a very sophisticated system called system of vibrations, Spanda. Consciousness vibrates and generates this entire universe. So our Swami Medhananda Ayan Maharaj calls it a Baroque philosophy because it's so intricate. Advaita Vedanta is very neat and elegant that way. Kashmir Shaivism is extraordinarily complex. Uh, but anyway... That's what they're saying. It, this entire universe is the play of Shiva. What is Shiva? Consciousness. Chid Vilasa, the play of Shiva. Uh, the play of consciousness. But now the Advaitin comes and asks, wait a minute, play? Does consciousness play? Play implies some kind of activity, some kind of change. You can't play without some kind of change. Some kind of activity. So all these activities and changes... Is consciousness doing it or are they being experienced in consciousness? And if you look at our own experience, we'll say, yeah, it's being experienced in consciousness. Whatever ex changes you experience in life, they're experienced in consciousness, which is a better way of putting it. That consciousness is vibrating or consciousness is experiencing. If consciousness vibrates, even that vibration is an experience. Mm -hmm. The very nature of consciousness is to experience. Like the nature of the eyes is to see. The very nature of consciousness is to experience. Anubhava. That's the very nature of consciousness. You can poetically call it playing, but actually, if you're going to be rigorous and a little bit of a dry philosopher, you will say it's not playing. It's an appearance in consciousness. This is called in Sanskrit, Chid Vivarta. What's an appearance in consciousness? Don't forget our, our whole goal. What are we trying to explain? Material universe. Jagat. Material universe is not the play of consciousness, not the vibration of consciousness, not the products of consciousness, but it is an appearance in consciousness. Where are we now? We are at the fourth, the fourth level of explanation, that chid vivarta. It's an appearance um, in a fifth level, right? First was Jagat, world. Second was the constituents of the world, Panchabhuta, five elements. The third was Maya Vilasa, the play of Maya. The fourth was uh, Chid Vilasa, play of consciousness. The fifth explanation is appearance in consciousness, Chid Vivatta. Chid Vivatta. Just like the snake appears in the rope by an error. Just like the mirage, the water appears in the mirage, in the desert, by the heated air and the play of the light there, you see water. It appears there. It's not that the desert and the light are playing around and creating water there. It's not that the rope is playing around and generating a snake. No. It appears there. It's an appearance there. This appearance is called Chid Vivarta. Chid Vivarta means the... The cause appears as the effect without being actually changed into the effect. It's not like a seed which is actually changed into a plant. It's not like the milk which is actually changed into yogurt, into curd. It's more like the rope which appears as the snake. It's more like the colorless sky which appears blue when you look out there. It's more like the waterless desert which appears as an oasis in the mirage. Nothing has changed. It just looks like that. 
it just appears like that one sadhu in uttarakhand would say this sweeping his arms around the magnificent snow peaks and the rushing water of the ganga and say is sab dikhta hai mahatma ji hai nahi all of this appears o oh monk not there <laughs> it's not there it appears in awareness uh, this is a very crucial theory in advaita vedanta to understand advaita vedanta you must understand this is a technical word for this this is called adhyasa superimposition what is superimposition is a technical word again it simply means taking one thing for another taking something to be what it is not not uh, what it is not atasmin tad buddhi what's not there you think it's that that's called superimposition supervenience there are new words in in philosophy now a very ancient word shankaracharya used it adhyasa in fact he introduces his most monumental work the his commentary on the brahma sutras with an essay just two three pages and the essay is called adhyasa bhashya the commentary on superimposition he introduces the concept of adhyasa superimposition there i have mentioned it to you earlier also one of the greatest philosophers i knew professor j n mahanti he told me once in the institute of culture in kolkata he said of all the sacred and philosophical literatures of the east and the west which i have read nothing comes close in profundity in depth to that first sentence of the adhyasa bhashya where it, the the concept of superimposition is is introduced so this is this the fifth stage in the reduction of material universe to consciousness that it's an appearance it's a superimposition technical word adhyasa the fifth stage is called chid vivarta the appearance of consciousness what is the appearance of consciousness the world that means this world which we are experiencing is an appearance of consciousness to consciousness if i am consciousness you are consciousness then the world which you experience all of this out there is you you are shining when the world shines it is you who are shining ashtavakra sings in a shloka after this he says prakasham me nijam roopam my very nature is light prakasham me nijam roopam nati rikto asmi tatah i am nothing more than light light shining that's what i am when i shine forth when the universe shine shines forth यदा प्रकाशते विश्वम तदा अहम भास एव ही व्हेन द यूनिवर्स शाइन्स फोर्थ इट इज आई अलोन हु आई एम शाइनिंग लाइट शाइनिंग दैट दैट्स ऑल दैट एग्जिस्ट्स एंड आई एम दैट लाइट सो दिस इज द द फिफ्थ स्टेज द स्टेज ऑफ चिद विवर्त अपीयरेंस ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस टेक्निकली अध्यास सुपर इम्पोजिशन देन the next step the we asked the question yes rope is appearing by mistake as the snake the desert is appearing as water the sky is appearing as blue but that snake isn't all of it pervaded by the rope that water which looks there it's there it's not water isn't it just sand And this colorless sky the, the blue in the sky isn't it all pervaded by the actually colorless sky Sri Ramakrishna says the water in the ocean looks dark deep blue or black from a distance when you go and to take it in your hands colorless so isn't that colorless water actually pervading what seems to be the dark ocean or blue ocean so the second the the, the sixth step is called chinmaya pervaded by awareness pervaded by consciousness fifth step was appearance question was what is that appearance what's it made of it's pervaded by consciousness it's nothing other than consciousness pervaded by consciousness but then the next question we ask is what is this pervaded pervaded relationship is it like this room it was dark and then we switched on the light and the light pervaded the room is it like this room and we lit an incense stick and the fragrance of the incense pervaded this room is it like that that way or is it like the lectern and wood wood pervades this lectern but what it means is every bit of this lectern is nothing but wood is it like um, the ocean the, the waves in the ocean and water water pervades the waves means those waves are nothing but water 
Every bit of it is water. What you touch there is water. Gold ornaments. Pervaded by gold means not that there is an ornament and then you fill gold into it. It's, every bit of it is gold. Similarly, pervaded by consciousness means it is nothing but consciousness. The seventh step called Chin Matram. Consciousness only. This entire universe is consciousness only. We started with what? Jagat. Universe. Step one. Step two. Panchabhuta Vilasa. Play of five elements. Step three. The paradox of Maya. Maya Vilasa. And if you are skeptical at this step, as any modern thinker might be skeptical, I refer you to Rebecca Goldstein, who talks about the latest discoveries in science. Not very different in tone, at least, from what uh, uh, the ancients were saying. Maya, Avilasa, the play of Maya. And Maya is nothing but that unique power of consciousness. So, Chid Vilasa, the play of consciousness. Yeah. Then fifth, it's not the play of consciousness. It's an appearance. The universe is an appearance in consciousness. Chid Vivarta, consciousness without changing, appears as the universe. The concept of Adhyasa, superimposition comes in here. The key concept for Advaita Vedanta. Then sixth, Chin Maya, pervaded by consciousness. And then finally, Chin Matra, consciousness only. Consciousness only. The entire universe is a dream-like presentation in consciousness. Um, just as a sidebar, let me just say, Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta, it is at this final stage that they come to they meet. I'm talking about Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, recently, I got, a, got hold of a wonderful little volume, um, uh, Progressive Stages of Meditation on Emptiness. So the most sophisticated, the core philosophy of Buddhism, which you find in Tibetan Buddhism, I think that's the most sophisticated philosophical development of Buddhism uh, uh, anywhere on this planet. So, you know, the Dalai Lama's philosophy, the, uh, his followers. Now there, that, uh, that book, it shows us how in five stages, deeper and deeper you understand emptiness, shunyata. First stage, the Theravada understanding of emptiness. Stage one of understanding emptiness. Um, first stage is the Theravada understanding or what they call the Shravakayana. Um, that in the body and this mind, which is five skandhas, five aggregates, uh, there is no self. If you investigate, you don't find any permanent self in the body-mind. That's the first understanding. Emptiness, body-mind is empty of any self. This is also the Buddhist understanding of anatma, no self. You go deeper. Uh, the second understanding of emptiness is the mind-only school, Chitta Matra school. Not Chin Matra, consciousness only, it's mind-only school. The Chitta Matra school of uh, Buddhism, also known as Yogacara, also known as Vijnanavada. Uh, again, I'm giving a very sweeping presentation. Uh, I can see my Harvard professor's eyebrows shooting up to the forehead <laughs> in astonishment at the cavalier way I'm, I'm rushing through everything, through thousands of years of philosophizing. But anyway, the mind-only school. What does it say? It says even the body and the mind uh, and the body and the world outside, they have no existence. The, the material entities, not only there's no self there, there is there's no existence outside. They are all in the mind only. Yeah. A, a subjective idealism. A lot like the Berkeley and subjective idealism. That's the second stage of understanding of emptiness. Emptiness of the outer, of the object. Third, the emptiness school itself, Shunyavada, Nagarjuna's Shunyavada, which is the central philosophy of Tibetan Buddhism. So they have uh, two subtle varieties here. Swatantrika Shunyavada, Swatantrika Madhyamaka, it's also called Madhyamaka school. Nagarjuna's Madhyamaka school. Swatantrika Madhyamaka and Prasangika Madhyamaka. What does the Swatantrika Madhyamaka say? The third stage of understanding emptiness. It says, not only is that external world, the object empty, but the subject is also empty. <laughs> there is no reality to uh, independent reality to the world outside and there is no independent uh, you know, re reality here in the so-called subject. Subject, object, the example they give is he heaps of hay you know, stacked up in a farmer's field leaning against each other. Subject and object support each other. But it's not that the subject is real, like the mind-only school might want to say. And the object is an appearance in the subject. No. Both are, they rise and fall together. Both are empty. Subject is empty, object is empty. 
Who says this? The Madhyamaka. Which kind of Madhyamaka school? The Swatantraka Madhyamaka. The fourth stage is even more subtle. But really, really, it becomes very difficult and abstruse here. Uh, they, the fourth stage is the, the Prasangika Madhyamaka, which are Dalai Lama's own school, the Galukpa school. They come in and say, you are making emptiness itself a reality. So we, should, we must talk about the emptiness of emptiness. <laughs> That's the <laughs> fourth stage of understanding of emptiness. That emptiness of emptiness. That also is not a reality. Nagarjuna 2000 years ago in India, the great philosopher Nagarjuna had said, do not misunderstand emptiness. Emptiness is an antidote to the, the sufferings of the world. If you understand emptiness, you'll be relieved of the sufferings of the world. But those who take emptiness itself to be another reality, nobody can help them. Emptiness can help everybody to overcome the sufferings of the world. But those little extra intelligent people who hold on to emptiness itself as the final truth. I've got the truth, emptiness. He says, nobody can help them. <laughs> uh, he says, yatha sarpo durgrihita, durgrihita. Holding a snake at the wrong end. <laughs> You're going to get bitten. So emptiness of emptiness. Who says this? The prasangika madhyamaka the most sophisticated development of the emptiness school which is actually the core philosophy which the Dalai Lama and his, his uh, uh, monks they study. But that's the fourth. There is one more beyond that. Then you will see how we are on familiar ground. What does it say? The final thing school is called the Shentong school. And what does it say? That in the vast unlimited basic space of awareness the universe is like a magical appearance, a dream. So, uh, the vast, unlimited, basic space of awareness, if you translate it in Sanskrit, it sounds like Chidakasha. Entire universe is a, like a display in Chidakasha, like a fireworks display, like a, at night, like a, like a dream, like an, a great illusion, a magical illusion, which is exactly what we have been saying so far. The last one, Chin Matra, consciousness only. They call it vast, unlimited space of awareness. We are calling it Chin Matra, consciousness only. Universe is nothing but consciousness only. It's an appearance in consciousness only. Nothing different from consciousness only. This is the conception of Brahman in Advaita Vedanta. What is this universe? It is nothing but existence only. What is this universe? It is nothing but consciousness only. What is this universe? It is nothing but finally bliss only. Sat Chit Ananda. How can we think of all of this as existence only, or consciousness only, or bliss only? We get clues from the three states of waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Hmm? Consider this waking state. State. What are we trying to do? Understand Satchit Ananda. Consider this waking state. What's our feeling about this waking state? Things are real here. Dreams are not real, but this is real. Real chairs, real people, real room, even real space, you know, empty space is also real. Real sounds and sights and smells and touches, uh, real pains and pleasures, it's real, real. What is real is, this is, that is. What Advaita Vedanta says is, you take that isness which is so evident in the waking state and focus on that. Think of this waking state itself as an ocean of isness, existence. It's easier in the waking state because you feel this existence. It, it's very difficult to say that waking state is a dream. Why? Because it feels real. Advaita says, take that reality. Instead of cutting it up into little tables, chairs, people, take it as an ocean of reality in which, like waves in an ocean, chairs and people and vehicles and trees and sky and earth are appearing and changing. But the reality itself is like an unbroken ocean of water is. Where do you understand this? In the waking state. You get a clue from the dream state. What is a dream state? When you wake up from a dream and you analyze it, what happened? The mind in itself, the mind is supposed to be something in here. In the waking state, it doesn't seem that this is a mind. Uh, the waking state, it seems it's out there, real. The mind is something in here, it feels like that. Well, that mind which is in here, in the dream state, it became a whole world. There were people, there was sky and earth, there were things happening. There were living and non-living things. There was pleasure and pain. There were all sorts of activities going on, mostly crazy. Yeah. That's a dream. And it was the mind itself, by itself, which appeared as all of that. 
that gives us a clue as to how consciousness can appear as its own object you, you see the dream state makes it very uh, believable understandable how consciousness can appear as its own objects what we are aware of is not apart from the awareness just as in the dream whatever we saw was not apart from the dreaming mind and the deep sleep state gives us a clue to ananda bliss and not particular pleasures not this little excitement that little excitement not this tickling of the senses but a peace beyond all problems a peace that you know passeth understanding that cannot be disturbed you see even the sickest person even the most unhappy person when they fall into deep sleep no problem at all all the problems come when the mind vibrates then the problems arise but when the mind shuts down beyond that from the perspective of the mind it feels like nothing yeah obviously there's no problem because there's nothing how can there be a problem no from the mind's perspective it's nothing from your perspective it's the absence of the mind and that absolute calm to which we return it seems like nothing but why do we do do we want it so much why do we go back to it it's because it is the deepest rest that we get that's a clue to ananda Ananda is not particular little joys. Mm. So the waking state gives us the clue to sat existence. The waking st- the dream state gives us a clue to how consciousness can be everything chit. The dream state gives us an ex- uh, uh, idea of how ananda can be bliss and beyond all suffering the deep sleep. Deep sleep state gives us that e- experience. Jagrat swapna sushupti waking dreaming deep sleep this is a very nice way of understanding sat chit ananda. Mm. Just a clue to each one why i am talking about satchidananda this is what we have come to in in um, you know at this point in our analysis the ultimate reality which alone is appearing as this entire universe one reason i thought of thinking about it was last week i got two questions about the same the same question from two places this formulation of the ultimate reality as sat chit ananda existence consciousness bliss so what's the history of it when did it first come together in this form one one the same question one came from harvard university another one came from a researcher in beijing china the same question of course that researcher also studied two years ago at harvard so there must be a link there <laughs> they must be discussing this what how did sat chit ananda evolve this this conception it's what th- it's it's a delightful subject to dwell upon it's and remember we're talking about our own reality what is satchidananda what is satchidananda existence consciousness bliss satchidananda is first and fundamental one satchidananda is infinity satchidananda is oneness it's the first and fundamental thing in uh, you know existence and and in consciousness and in bliss what does it mean first and fundamental what does it mean that it is uh, infinite what does it mean that satchidananda is oneness quickly let me run you through this um first and fundamental upanishad says brahma vidya sarva vidya pratishtham mundak upanishad it says the knowledge of brahman the science of brahman is the foundation of all sciences because brahman is the foundation of everything how so here we go to the german philosopher heidegger a very nice analysis of existence a question of what is existence in our terms what is sat now heidegger nobody read not many people read him today he is out of favor he was a nazi so, yeah which goes to say that show that even super intelligent people can also be very fallible human beings you know out of sheer moral weakness he was a nazi but he had some brilliant insights so one of those insights i'm sharing with you in his introduction to metaphysics the first lecture is on he talks about existence and he says this is the question which western philosophy abandoned during the greek period itself what is existence what are existing things what is space what is earth what is life what is good what is bad that comes later but what is existence itself what is isness itself that was seen as too difficult a question too abstract a question nobody wanted to venture into it and heidegger said i am reviving this question this is the question in our vedantic terms what is sat pure being so heidegger says he gives us an insight into it he says this question what is existence 
He says it is the widest question, the deepest question, the most fundamental question. Widest, deepest, most fundamental. Why widest? Think about it. Every subject that we study, suppose you are studying um, uh, biology. So the person who is studying biology is interested in a particular subset of knowledge. He's not all that interested in chemistry as, as long as it doesn't uh, have direct bearing on his study of life. Uh, he's not interested in uh, uh, music. He's not interested in grammar. He's interested in biology, in, in the particular uh, organisms he's studying. But a person who is interested, so he's studying maybe plants, but not interested in animals. But a person who's studying life will be interested in plants and animals, a wider question. A person, if you are interested in living things and non-living things, then you'll be um, interested in an even wider um, question, which includes physics, chemistry, biology. Uh, so what's the widest possible question, which will include everything and, and leave out nothing? Then the question must be, what is existence itself? What will you study there? Everything that exists. Someone might say, but... What about non-existence? Then you will not study that. You are leaving it out. Huh? <laughs> but the answer is non-existence does not exist. So there is no problem. <laughs> you are not leaving out anything that exists. Because what is existence cover is the widest question. All fields of human inquiry. All sciences. All arts. All religion. Even if God. Heaven. Eh, existing. Any religion. Ask. Are you talking about God exists or does not exist? They will say no, no. It exists. God exists, he, she, it exists, then it is included in the question, what is existence? Uh, widest question. Deepest question. What do you mean by deep question? Look at the sciences. If you are studying, say, neuroscience, um, then like a more fundamental question than neuroscience would be the study of the physiology, which includes brain and nervous systems, but also the whole body. Even more deeper than that would be the study of, uh, of life itself. Even deeper than that would be the study of chemistry, the chemical basis of life then. And more fundamental. Even deeper than that chemistry would be physics, which, which are, makes up the um, uh, materials you study in chemistry. The particles, particle physics for example. Uh, even deeper than that, is there anything deeper than fundamental physics? Yes. Mathematicians will say, yeah, we are here. I saw a cartoon, you know, which shows deeper and deeper levels of study. So there is the doctor who is studying um, physiology. Then the next is the biologist who is saying, I'm superior, I study life itself. Next comes the chemist. I say, I study the basis of life, which is chemical elements, you know, organic, inorganic. And then the higher than that is the uh, physics, physics professor who says, oh, I'm studying the fundamental particles out of which your chemicals are made. And then, far higher is the mathematician. You say, you who I am here, I am studying the b basics of reality itself, uh, you know, mathematics. So, deepest, deeper than that is what? Existence itself. So, existence is the deepest question. Widest, deepest question. And then finally, most fundamental question. What do you mean by fundamental? It's a little subtle. Every subject is, when you study something, you're studying that, you're not studying yourself. You're studying biology. So the, or you're studying, say, mathematics. It's not studying the mathematician himself. Mathematician is studying mathematics. But when you say, what is existence? That question, what is existence, is also existing. It shares in existence. It's a kind of existence. If questions exist, so it's some kind of existence. So question also exists. So it's not only questioning everything that exists, it's questioning itself also. It's self-referential. So these are the most fundamental types of questions which question themselves also. So anyway, the whole point is Sat is fundamental. It's the most primary of things. The first, uh, it's the widest question, deepest question and uh, the most uh, uh, fundamental question. Chit, consciousness. It is consciousness first and then every experience becomes possible. Worldly experience, spiritual experience, from taking a, drinking a cup of coffee to seeing God. All of that first consciousness. Upanishad says, Tameva bhanta manubhati sarvam tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati By its light, everything here is lit up. That shining, everything shines. Or in Ashtavakra's language, I, by my light, everything here is lit up. I shining, 
everything shines prakasham me nijam roopam so consciousness is fundamental it's first and ananda um, bliss that is fundamental the ananda of the self is the foundation of all bliss the uh, vidyaranya swami in panchadashi about 700 years ago in the south of india classic of advaita vedanta there he says he gives a very uh, interesting argument he says that the self is the most um, is the source of all happiness is the source of maximum happiness and everlasting happiness atman consciousness existence you yourself is the source of is maximum happiness and everlasting happiness we normally don't think about it that way we think there are things out there which are sources of our happiness a cookie is a source of my happiness not maximum not everlasting also thank god you know who who would want an everlasting cookie so <laughs> but from a cookie up to say classical music up to devotion god all of those are sources of happiness we think of it outside ourselves we never think i am the source of all happiness and maximum happiness and everlasting happiness how does he say so let me just touch touch upon that and wrap up um vidyaranya says that which we like we try to get it or keep it that which we do not like we try to get rid of it either we avoid it or we get rid of it something that gives me pleasure pain that that something that gives me joy happiness i try to get it it could be a person it could be an activity it could be a gadget it could be a book i try to get it and keep it and if i don't like it i try to get rid of it or i try to avoid it now the reverse is also true if there is something which is giving me happiness continuously i will never try to get rid of it it's the reverse of that logic now notice one thing we never try to get rid of anybody is one's own self and so immediately objection suicide yes but suicide is because of an adventitious something from outside uh, somebody who is in depression somebody who has got a big maybe a lot of money to pay off uh, is going to be evicted from his or her home depression i want to kill myself then you help that person and you remove that debt you pay back the debt or something and then uh, so what happened what happened to your project of killing yourself oh no now i don't want to kill myself that means there's nothing wrong with myself it was the debt which made it intolerable nobody ever really wants to kill themselves for the sake of themselves it's something from outside which comes so we never want to get rid of ourselves if we never want to get rid of ourselves that means we are everlastingly the source of joy for ourselves look at the logic yeah something you like you try to keep it if you something you're trying to keep that means you like it why do you like it it must be giving you happiness we try to keep ourselves we try to remain alive this struggle for life is the most fundamental urge in human beings we try to keep ourselves alive all the time i am i want to be i want to exist and vidyaranya takes it in a unique direction aha you want to keep yourself alive all the time that means you like yourself all the time that means you are a source of happiness to yourself all the time everlasting source of happiness who ananda you this is the meaning of ananda one meaning so yeah but that's a very little happiness not maximum happiness huh. other things in the world give me much more happiness it's sort of baseline little drips of happiness from from my own existence but i need to add to it from everything in the world that's what we feel no vidyaranya goes and says that no your you yourself are your own source of maximum happiness you just don't see it <laughs> how are you the source of maximum happiness he gives us another cute argument we don't think about it that way peculiar argument what is the argument he wants to show that i myself am the source of my own greatest happiness the logic he uses is you love things because they make you happy now if one thing is loved more than the other thing if one thing is loved for the sake of another thing a is loved for the sake of b which one do you love more b yeah. if the mother loves the child's toys uh, and which which are the they belong to the child they love for the sake of the child because that the her child's toys that's why she loves them now what does she love more the toys or the child you will <laughs> this is of course the child 
it would be a very very strange mother who loves the <laughs> the toys uh, not the child that means you love the toys for the sake of the child that means you love the child more so okay that's reasonable what do you love most what is everything loved for the sake of upanishads say everything is loved for your own sake that sounds terribly selfish but <laughs> it it's not this that limited body mind we are talking about the atman um so there was this rich executive with a brilliant job in you know, a high paying job and uh, so he, somebody asked him the question you know so isn't it ultimately for the sake of the self everything he says no 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 i love my job for the sake of the job i love doing my job and he was honest he, he loved this he was young so <laughs> <laughs> i love the job itself so all right in that case your wonderful salary package which you get compensation from the company we are going to take that away and then you can do the job just for the job itself no 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 i want that okay so you love the job for the sake of the money that means you love the money more i guess so which one would you do I'll give you a choice you can do the job but no money or you can have the money no job which one would you prefer i'll have the money <laughs> all right so you love it for the sake of the money but now suppose you have the money and uh, you but you are not allowed to spend it you get money but you can't do anything with it no 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 i need to spend it for uh, uh, all the things that you can buy you know said so, all right then you love the things you can buy with the money more than the money yes well you can get all the things you can buy but you can't use any of it you can't give it to anybody you can't use it for yourself no 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 i need it all um, not for my sake but i need it all for my family hmm. also you love your family more than the things which you give your family of course yeah. all right but suppose that family they are no longer your family just some random family we'll pick we'll pick one out for you <laughs> you do it for them no they have to be my family ah so family for my family the my family is i which is loved more than the the family or i the logic says i see job but money is more important money but the things are more important things but family is more important but family but my family i am more important it has to be mine It's, it comes all the way back to the self even in a common sense analysis and of course advaitic analysis now i am loved most of all but what do you love that which makes you happy what do you love most that which makes you most happy i am loved most of all then i must be making myself most happy so the self is uh, is the source of continuous happiness and maximum happiness this is called ananda this is an analysis from vidyaranya swami thousands of years ago what comes of all this now you look back upon what uh, ashtavakra said uh, he says yatha prakashayam eka deham enam tatha jagat as i illumine this one body i illumine the entire world to the whole thing is presented to me mm. uh, atah he says uh, jagat sarvam mama jagat atah mama jagat sarvam and therefore this entire universe is mine or none of it is athava na cha kinchana the conclusion here is very dramatic why is this entire universe mine go back to the concept of adhyasa can the rope say that you are somebody sees a snake mistakes me for a snake somebody mistakes me for a garland somebody mistakes me for a crack in the earth well the crack in the earth the garland and and the snake are all me Uh, they are all mine cuz i am alone i'm being mistaken for all these things uh, i alone appear as this entire universe so it is all mine step 1 but then ashtavakra goes even deeper even deeper than the adhyasa of advaita vedanta he says but all mine is there all at all <laughs> are there people are there things are there places or is it consciousness light shining प्रकाशम मे निज रूप अनातिरिक्तस्म्यहम तत मै ओन नेचर इज लाइट शाइनिंग आई एम नॉट वन बिट मोर देन दैट इट इज ऑल माइन अथवा न च किंचन और इवन डीपर ट्रुथ नन ऑफ इट बिकॉज नन ऑफ इट एग्जिस्ट सो इज नथिंग नो 
I exist. Consciousness exists. Light shining. It is all light shining. Look, he's not denying the experience of the universe. He says, um, Yada prakashayat Vishwam Yada Prakashate Vishwam Tada Aham Bhasa Evahi. So when this entire universe shines forth, I shine forth. I means I light, I consciousness shine forth. Therefore, even when the universe is being experienced, when you are talking, hearing, walking, working, enjoying, suffering, all of it is as nothing because it is just light shining forth. It is all being itself, light itself, bliss itself. This is Sat. This is Chit. This is Ananda. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, the Holy Mother Masharada, Swami Vivekananda, may this magnificent vis- vision of Ashtavakra may dawn in our lives uh, and our lives be, lives be full of that light shining. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu